second to get organized. I'm so happy to be here. Well, the suspicion is, or the suspense is down because you know what question is. Uh, we'll get started with our introductions. My name is Kevin Fox. I'm an AP government teacher in Southern California. I'm a recovering We the People coach. I uh, had a class for 15 years. I've uh, included a couple trips here to, to nationals, and I know exactly how your teachers are feeling, and you will make them very proud. I'm um, Chuck Dunlap. I'm president and CEO of the Indiana Bar Foundation in Indianapolis. I'm Augustus Chin. I'm a Justice Court judge from Minnesota. Please introduce yourself to your teacher. Hi, my name is Will Kosicki, and my favorite amendment in the Bill of Rights is the Fourth Amendment, as it protects against unreasonable searches and seizures and heavily applies right to privacy. Hi, my name is Savannah Pasquan, and my favorite amendment is the Ninth Amendment, as it delegates the powers of the Constitution to protect people's rights. Hi there, my name is Sam Beer, and my favorite amendment is the First Amendment, as it has been historically used as an instrument to fight against oppression. Hi, my name is Annabelle Banerjee, and my favorite amendment in the Bill of Rights is the Third Amendment, as it embodies the idea of a man's belief castle and implies the rights of privacy for all. Hello, my name is Brenna Billings, and my favorite amendment in the Bill of Rights is the Fifth Amendment, as um, Locke's ideals of life, liberty, and property were enshrined in due process. And on behalf of Unit 5, our advisor, Gretchen Wolfing, Tom, I've been your high school, and the state of Washington. Thank you for joining us. All right, so I'll read the question, and we'll start listening. Okay. Has the creation of so-called fusion centers violated citizens' privacy rights, or are they necessary to preserve public safety? Why and how have the courts struggled with where to draw the line between national security and privacy? Uh, lastly, is the Fourth Amendment, ratified in 1791, still a viable safeguard against an overzealous government when it comes to modern technology? Why or why not? The right to be let alone is indeed the beginning of all freedom, just as William of Russia. Fusion centers, which streamline data sharing between levels of government, do not violate citizens' privacy rights. However, the unenumerated right to privacy leads to persisting debate within government policy. The penumbral right to privacy, implied under the first, third, fourth, fifth, ninth, and fourteenth amendments, is most predominantly defined under the fourth amendment's guarantee of being secure against unreasonable searches and seizures. Fusion centers established following 9-11 operate to collect, analyze, retain, or disseminate lawfully obtained information as articulated by the Washington State Fusion Center. Information gathered by fusion centers does not infringe on personal privacy as they use legally obtained information such as tips, suspicious activity reports, and social media posts. Additionally, fusion centers set guidelines for due process. The Department of Homeland Security reports that 95% of centers comply with ensuring there is a process in place for addressing complaints alleging violations of civil rights, civil liberties, and privacy. Due process exists to prevent fusion centers from violating the Fourth Amendment. In the event of a violation, legal recourse is available, providing a check on the activity of fusion centers. Thus, fusion centers do not violate citizens' privacy rights as so that information is collected legally and due process is in place when needed. The Supreme Court has struggled to balance national security and privacy as they have vague but conflicting meanings. This clash of ideals is illustrated in Amnesty v. Clapper, when a coalition of attorneys challenged the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act for monitoring international communications between clients. The court ruled the right to client attorney privilege did not supersede national security, as FISA was not impairing the lawyer. While this could potentially violate individual rights, national security must be prioritized. Even when national security infringes upon individuals, it frequently supersedes privacy. In FAA v. Visaga, FBI agents were sued for targeted and discriminatory surveillance after posting as members of the Islamic Center for Earth. The court ruled in favor of the agents under state secrets, which is the government's ability to withhold lawsuit information to protect national security, as established under FISA. In this case, it was unclear whether the execution was discriminatory, generating controversy over the invasion of privacy under the guise of national security. National security and the unenumerated right to privacy often grapple with each other before the Supreme Court due to the nation's interest in preserving the public welfare rather than the individual. While the Supreme Court has safeguarded privacy in technology through interpretation, the deliberative nature of the American court system leads to a delayed response to the rapid expansion of technology. For example, in Katz v. United States, prosecutors utilized incriminating evidence from a tapped public paper. The court ruled this tape could not be used, as individuals have a reasonable expectation of privacy, with the justice who are articulating that the role of the Fourth Amendment is to protect people, not places. Adapting to modern circumstances was accomplished in Carpenter v. United States, 
where four individuals were convicted using cell phone records as evidence. The Supreme Court ruled that, that a warrant is required for specific third party information as information given to cell phone providers is often involuntary. The ruling contradicted the previously established third party doctrine, which stated that individuals who consensually gave their information to a third party had no reasonable expectation of privacy. The court has upheld privacy in technology, but advancements are outpacing the judicial system. For example, there is no national precedent regarding facial recognition in tracking individuals. While some state legislation exists, such as the recent Senate, Washington Senate Bill 6280, there is yet to be national legislation demonstrating the government's inability to respond to evolving privacy concerns. While the Supreme Court has attempted to uphold the right to privacy embodied in the Fourth Amendment, evolving circumstances have led to a precarious relationship between the rights of the people and the power of our government. Okay, I also want to reflect on something you brought up in your statement, uh, referring to the due process expectation that the, the standards and the states for the, the fusion centers will prevent some violations. But then if a violation occurred, there would be some uh, legal remedy. What is that legal remedy and do you think it's adequate? It's important to note that there is, if someone feels that they have a violation, that they can contact their local representatives and fusion centers, at least in Washington State, make it very easy to contact with the website about how to contact them, the different agencies they work with. And so if they feel that they have a violation, the first step would be to contact these agencies or maybe contact an attorney about how to move forward with the steps of legal recourse. A relatively recent example of an individual receiving compensation for a violation of, of privacy or civil liberties from uh, the use of the uh, intelligence community was seen in the Sherry Chen United States case in which Sherry Chen felt as if she had been discriminated against when the FBI um, targeted her potentially due to her race uh, or national origin um, and she did receive monetary compensation um, and a public apology for this deposition. However, I would personally argue that in the intelligence community, there are some risks to actually getting retribution from our government when there are invasions of privacy. This is seen in Jules v. NSA, where the NSA was sued for violating individual rights. And when asked to provide evidence of these violations, the NSA responded that it would be a violation of national security if they provided said evidence, therefore winning their case by default, and therefore no retribution was offered to the individuals. And I think this demonstrates that oftentimes people do not get retribution for these violations. Given what you have said, what will your response be to those who view fusion centers as an Orwellian black hole? I would agree. I would say that at large, the, the fusion centers are very obsolete and that they are quite arbitrary. And I think that our intelligence community at all, which is made up of 18 different agencies, is capable without the use of fusion centers, <coughs> which have been proven to be less than effective. I would completely agree. It's been noted by the head of Fusion Centers himself, Mike Senna, that it's impossible to tell how effective Fusion Centers actually are. And due to the mass collection of information, it's hard to effectively implement the information that they have since as they can't discern what is and isn't uh, important to know. And if we have so much information, we can't effectively implement it. It does um, seem to be a black hole of information that is ineffective. An example of what my colleague is describing was in 2021, for mass shootings, there were 690, there were 693 mass shootings, but only 37 of them were assisted by fusion centers, which is about 5%, showing the inefficiency of having mass amounts of data and not being able to regulate and not being able to organize it sufficiently. Just to clarify what we said in our essay in case there's any confusion, we do believe that fusion centers could be considered constitutionally appropriate and were founded in a very good idea and do not necessarily violate the Fourth Amendment. However, their application um, within our government today is ineffective and needs to be reformed. Is there a role for states in this area of protection of privacy or do you think it's generally uh, left, better left to the federal level, uh, federal constitutional protections or, or legislative uh, through Congress? I would personally argue that there's a major benefit to allowing states to give privacy rights to their citizens. This can be seen in our home state of Washington, where we have an explicit right to privacy in Article 1, Section 7, and this has allowed for important cases such as Washington State v. Bullen, which gave us a personal right to privacy in our trash. And I think this is really important because it allows our state governments to give the rights that we feel are necessary to their citizens. Contradictory to Washington v. Bullen, we can see that in California v. Greenwood, they ruled that um, the citizens' garbage did not fall under a reasonable expectation of privacy. So therefore, we can see that the states do not feel a, a uniform way regarding privacy. So henceforth, it is beneficial to not have a uniform privacy regulation. As we can see that privacy and technology 
constantly adapting and each state feels differently and their legislation should represent this idea. I would say that we need to increase uh, privacy regulations from the federal government because even from state to state levels, the although some might have the right to privacy, others might not have otherwise. For example, in Louisiana, they have the right to privacy under Article 5 of their state constitution, but do not have a uh, right to abortion. And under Justice Brennan's, Justice Brennan's concurrence of the uh, Ajahn Sat V. Bear decision, he noted that if it, um, the right to privacy between a married couple is one of the most fundamental rights of privacy we have. And under the current Dobbs v. Jackson ruling, because that is left up to states' rights, that right to privacy is no longer protected and should be, con and when it should be further protected by the federal government as it is such a fundamental right. Given what you've said, would you support a federal constitutional amendment to have an expressed right to privacy that would be as explicit as what's noted in Washington? I would um, not necessarily uh, advocate for an explicit right to privacy because I do agree with my colleagues that privacy from state to state is important. <coughs> However, I would advocate for some sort of medical provisions or some sort of amendment that recognizes abortion and that right, that specific right to privacy as being federally protected. Adding on to my colleague, I feel that any danger with a federal explicit right to privacy is that the right to privacy and what we need from our government is constantly evolving and changing. And if we lay in the groundwork of a right to privacy, that might prevent further privacy protections when we make more te technological advancements than what we have today. I, just, I disagree with my colleague Savannah. I think it is necessary to have a national a national amendment for privacy to guarantee that the rights of privacy are for all for, for all citizens. In Justice Alito's dissenting opinion of Louisa B. Ramos, he declared that precedent was incredibly important for decision. However, two years later, he overturned the Roe v. Wade decision, which was a 50-year precedent, showing how the courts is not a sufficient guarantee of our rights, and we need to have an amendment to guarantee those. To agree with my colleague Annabelle, we can see that um, if we lose privacy and if we don't enumerate it now, then it could be dangerous and that we could lose it in the future. Um, in his dissent of the Dr. Jackson um, decision, Prince Thompson um, puts this idea of the slippery slope which means that once we lose one right, other rights are up for the taking, um, including privacy rights. So I think that there is a very distinct danger when we do not define privacy, and that we all as Americans in the forthcoming years could possibly expect to lose it. When we talk about the issue, when we talk about the issue of privacy, this totally goes back to the issue of a reasonable expectation of privacy is just extremely difficult to define. For example, in the early 1900s case of Hester United States, it was defined that when an infant threw out a drug into the public field, uh, kind of the public fields doctrine that this wasn't necessarily under the jurisdiction of reasonable expectation of privacy. However, um, in the modern United States, this is uh, mostly contended, for example, in the Pippin, uh, in the state of Pippin uh, ideals of what we define as reasonable expectation of privacy is we expect that our trash will go to a dump, not that it'll be stored by the police, which implies that an event potentially encompassing the idea of what entails a reasonable expectation of privacy could be beneficial to ensuring this protection for American citizens. I apologize, it was State v. Bowens that my colleague was referring to with the trash. So how does the Fourth Amendment work at your public high school? There are many protections in our public high school with the Fourth Amendment, for example, under searches and seizures in local parentis, which was established in Kilo v. New Jersey. In our local high school, an administrator must have at least two administrators in a room to be searched within our public high school, and, it is, and that is something that is stated in our student handbook, so we know those rights as well. Additionally, in our student handbook, if you choose to park on campus, you also sign away your right to your vehicle. For example, if you're searched in the building, your car can also be searched, and incriminating evidence, uh, for example, drugs or weapons, can be utilized in prosecution of criminal cases. Furthermore, we can see that um, in a notorious case of the Reddington School District, that um, there was the essential abuse of a child, and um, after recognizing this, our school has now incorporated policies to include the safety of students when their Fourth Amendment rights um, might be being abridged. So um, having that protection of two teachers within the room and the students are also being told if they're being searched has this extra benefit of securing the safety of these students. We call the amendment the staff of the Reddington School District. What's the standard? The standard of? Search. In our school, the standard of search is that we only search what is expected and at the degree of what is expected. So if we suspect that there might be nicotine on a person, we would only search to the degree that nicotine is. But if there was possibly a gun on an individual, there would be much higher urgency in our school when searching that individual. And I think it always relates to the context of what is at hand. Furthermore, under TLL v. New Jersey, it was decided that 
only probable cause is required for a search within a school, not a warrant. So this is uh, the only reasonable suspicion is required for a search in a school, which kind of uh, takes away the jurisdiction that a police officer needs to search an individual on the street or an individual to get drugs. So along that line, do you think that the courts have gone too far in establishing uh, exceptions to the warrant requirement, or do you think that for the most part they've drawn the right uh, the, the right balance between those uh, those competing interests? For the most. For the most part, I think that the courts have drawn a good distinction between the rights of privacy, but also not invade, no, well, not invading on the rights of privacy, but also safety of all. The case that best demonstrates this, in my opinion, is Birchfield v. North Dakota, which showed, which was when drunk, excuse me, for drunk driving, you you are not allowed to use um, blood tests to administer, you're not allowed to administer blood tests for drunk drivers. However, breathalyzers are ruled as constitutional, and that's because of the invasion of privacy and the extent of which Getting, getting a blood sample versus getting a breathing air that you normally do in public. Adding on to my comment, I feel that the importance of having warrant exceptions is to ensure public safety. This can be seen in Terry v. Ohio, where it was decided that during Terry stops, you can stop and frisk individuals if there is danger to public security. And it's important to note that without these cer certain warrant exceptions, we might harm individuals in the process. And I think sometimes rights such as the Fourth Amendment need to be stripped slightly to ensure that certain rights, such as the right to life, never are harmed. Just to elaborate on this issue of uh, public security, uh, when we talk about automobiles, uh, automobiles and traffic stops, uh, this is typically about a contentious form of warrant exceptions. For example, in the case of the United States v. Plates, it was ruled that a drug that can be used at, uh, for public public locations, such as ferry terminals or uh, other places where uh, bombs or dangerous materials can be uh, harmful to the public security, and that this kind of strips away these individual rights in your in your public space in your vehicle, but it is in a private uh, area, such as a road or a ferry stop. I'd like to read oh. my. <laughs> 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 well, that's a great sign because you're just engaged. Uh, I have no idea what time it was. It was just beautiful. Thank you for that conversation. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, your analysis, your incredible depth of knowledge. The court citations were numerous and appropriate. I don't explain. I appreciate that very much. I really, as always, I love when you bring these big federal national ideas down to your level, right? Whether at your school or your community or your state, um, because they affect us, right, at all levels of our existence. Um, uh, and, and I really like how you help each other. You say to the team, right? So if somebody misspoke, big deal. Somebody just made sure we knew that the, what the right answer was, and that's great. And you, you drive along, and that was beautiful. Because that's what it's about. We're not always going to remember every fact that we remember. Um, and you supported each other. Uh, yeah, so thank you. I, ho sorry. I wholeheartedly agree. The local application was very refreshing, and particularly your familiarity in terms of what's happening and the personal approach in terms of your school. I appreciate the clarification in response to the question about fusion centers as well. That was well done on your part, uh, and your efforts as a team is <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I agree, and, and I, I was noting the inconsistency, or at least perceived inconsistency, so I'm glad that you sort of wrapped that and, and, and connected those dots for us, because that was something that I was left like, huh, well, that seems a little different than what they were saying at the beginning, but I, I appreciated that. Um, also, uh, I, I appreciated a couple different aspects of the idea that precedent isn't strong enough. We need some additional things there. We can't rely on that because courts change, perspectives, perspectives can change, uh, compositions of courts can change, things like that. Um, and also the state versus federal, that there is a role for state constitutions and state rulemaking, and that is a, a, a variation from state to state in, in, in some of these areas. Again, you can provide additional higher levels of security uh, or, or protections. Um, and I thought that was really well done. So, and again, the, the depth of knowledge, the specific examples that you cited were tremendous.